Hey, my name is Nathaniel Fawson. I'm a professional archaeologist. I have been for about a decade, a little more than a decade. Uh, and this channel is devoted to the archaeology of North America, in particular the region that we call the Eastern Woodlands. Now, today I wanted to talk about kind of a more deep end theoretical framework that I found really useful in my research, given that I work with foraging societies from the archaic period and uh, zooarchaeology and these kinds of questions. So, human behavioral ecology started out in the field of evolutionary ecology, looking at how animals move across their landscapes, focus on particular resources, budget their time on things, things like that. And this was found to be fairly effective in looking at human foraging societies because like animals, being animals, we also have particular thermodynamic needs that have to be met. Now within optimal, uh, within human behavioral ecology, there's also a um, kind of a, a, a sub concept called optimal foraging theory. And basically what this is saying is that nobody really wants to spend their entire day, every day, looking for and processing and cooking food. We've got other stuff that we want to do. So an optimal forager is not one that produces the most number, the highest amount of calories. Um, we're really only, an optimal forager, once they've met their, their threshold, their sufficiency threshold, what they need in order to be effective and survive and, and healthy, uh, they can stop and they, they can do other things with their time. It does mean that an optimal forager is able to efficiently and effectively meet that sufficiency threshold. So in order to kind of investigate how people are doing this archaeologically, what methods they're using, uh, we employ what are called diet breadth models. And a diet breadth model is basically just a graph that shows uh, on your y-axis how well a particular animal taxon is represented. So things like, or, or plant taxon also. So uh, deer and squirrels and hickory nuts and freshwater mussels and snails and all these things can be put on one of these diet breadth models and charted for their, their amplitude. And they're also ranked in order of their return rate. So after, usually in terms of kilocalories per hour of processing once you kill the animal. So it, uh, if you're trying to butcher a deer, that usually takes about an hour and a half. So per hour of deer butchery, you get a lot of calories compared to something like a well, an hour's worth of butchering squirrels, which produce very few calories um, per hour of work. So what we expect to find is that on an archaeological site, you will have a very high representation of those few highest ranked taxa, like white-tailed deer and uh, maybe bison or something like that, if those are around, and a fairly rapid drop-off to where you uh, see very few representations of low-ranked taxa, like freshwater mussels or small birds, things like that, squirrels, rats. But the reality is we almost never see that kind of ideal scenario, and we have to have some way of explaining that. So a uh, poor representation of deer might mean that um, the deer population has been depleted, and so that's pushing that hunting foraging group towards using slightly lower ranked taxa as, as kind of their base instead, like rabbits or raccoons or something like that. We can also see scenarios where we really do have well represented those highly ranked taxa, but we get weird little spikes in the middle, and we have to have a way to explain that. So one of the, the most common spikes in the middle is kind of an intermediate ranked animal, wild turkey, because you've got to pluck feathers and all this other stuff, their return rate can be kind of low. But because they move in groups, you know, you can be hunting turkeys and get a bunch of them all at once. That reduces the search time per animal, which then kind of mitigates the processing time. So 
all in all, it winds out up being that Turkey is, is a really good time investment if you can get a bunch of them all at once. And so sometimes we'll see those kinds of spikes in the middle of animals like turkeys and passenger pigeons that can be um, hunted in, in mass. Something else that we have to remember is that these groups are, you know, um, demographically diverse groups of people. We are not dealing with a bunch of ageless, genderless, calorie-seeking drones moving across a landscape looking for food. We're looking at communities that are interacting with each other and developing with each other and have these like micro politics between each other and delegation of tasks going on and things like that. So one thing that we see on these sites that can be very odd from a um, unnuanced understanding of human behavioral ecology for sure is a preponderance of squirrel and squirrels are very poor return rate animals it's it's only a couple of hundred uh i think it's like 100 kilocalories or something like that i'll look that up later um per hour of processing and in order to process squirrel for an hour you have to have a bunch of them anyway so what why do we see so many squirrels over uh, on sites when from a op optimal foraging theory perspective that's a huge waste of time my suspicion is that it has to do with kids, because kids have to learn how to become adults at some point. And if hunting is such a huge economic base for your community, you have to get really good at that from a fairly young age in a safe and secure environment. So if you send like an eight year old kid out to kill a deer, one, the kid's probably not going to be able to kill it. And if it you know, tries to approach it after it's been wounded, that deer can seriously harm or kill that child. So you can send kids out to go hunt squirrels, and we still do this today. I mean, growing up in Appalachia, kids went squirrel hunting with BB guns all the time. So kids can be sent out with, you know, like a blowgun or sling stones or something like that to kill squirrels, and that squirrel is not going to be able to do a whole lot of damage to that kid to the point that, uh, you know, by the time that eight-year-old is, you know, 13, 14, 15 years old, they've already killed and scanned and cleaned and, and all the rest, hundreds of squirrels that have been, you know, brought back and added to whatever soup mom's making for dinner or whatever. So that's it's one of the reasons I, I tend to think that the presence of squirrels in large numbers can have quite a bit to do with the behavior of children and not so much adults because of that discrepancy and return rate. There is another possibility with those low ranked, um, low ranked taxa, and that's ubiquity and availability and the agenda, right? So if someone needs food, but they have other things on, on their, you know, their plan for the day is not to sit in the woods for four hours, hoping a deer shows up. They want something quick and now. Squirrels are everywhere. You can take, you know, two of them in 15 minutes if you know what, what you're doing. They don't really hide from people very much. Um, and they're kind of pests. They're they're really annoying. They'll get into your stuff and try to eat your food and, and stuff. I work in the woods. I have to deal with them all the time. So I understand absolutely why someone would uh, decide to just go ahead and kill a couple of squirrels, skin and eat those, and then be about their day. Um I've described it before as the Taco Bell of the Archaic. It's it's not great, but it's you know quick and effective, and uh, it doesn't occupy a whole lot of time. If that's what you know, you know you you have other things you want to do with your time that particular in that particular instance. Um, another one is turtles, and the thing with turtles is that they can't really get away from you. Um, it's very easy to just be you know doing something else, run into one, pick it up, throw it in a bag, and carry it on. It's very opportunistic dealing with turtles. You also get a lot of uh, secondary resources from the turtle, most especially the shell. That's a natural bowl, cup, what have you, that doesn't take a whole lot of secondary processing to turn it to turn into a useful uh, functional item. Um, there's also like rattles and things that are made out of them that have uh, ceremonial applications. So I hope that kind of very, very general, very brief and very southeastern archaic focused explanation of uh, human behavioral ecology um, 
was coherent enough that <laughs> that everyone understands it. Um, and I can go into greater detail on this if uh, if need be later. Um, if there are any questions, of course, you can always put those down in the comments. And thank you for watching.